I thank you very much for this interview. You are one of the most important innovation experts in the world. You develop the practical tools to make a business idea work. Uh, but uh, today we are speaking about your last book. I know you are publishing another one in the next few months, The Invincible Company, but I'd like to focus the online conversation to startups. Eh? The title of your book is Testing Business Ideas. The first question is, why did you think of this guide? Which were the needs you wanted to meet by writing it? So, uh, you know, together with uh, Strategizer, we work with companies around the world. Um, we work mainly with established companies, but we see the same in, in the startup world. You know, everybody's starting to use these tools. Everybody you know, is really starting to test ideas and everybody says, ah, oh, we do this, we do this. We do the lean startup thing. But the reality is that the quality of how people do it is not very good. Um, you know, they get started and, and, and that was okay at the beginning, but I think now we're getting a lot better at doing these things. So we thought, what can we do to help people get better at testing their ideas? Yes. It wasn't even to get them started. Some we still have to get, help them to get started, but many we had to help them get better. And in particular, go beyond the very basic stuff like doing an interview and then they say, oh, I tested my idea. I'd had 10 interviews or 20 interviews. Okay. There's nothing, right? That's, that's a good start, but you need to do 10, 20 different experiments to really seriously decrease the risk and you need to have a good process to do that. So we thought if we give a library of experiments to people, a whole library with many different experiments, they will get more sophisticated in the way they test their ideas. So that was the main thing to help people, you know, move from an innovation amateur <laughs> to becoming an innovation and entrepreneurship professional. Yeah. So we help yeah. them to do these things better, uh, you know, something that people have already been doing before. And those who haven't, we help them get started. Yes. And um, which are the most important difficulties in deciding to get starting with a business idea? <laughs> the, the, I think the, the, the big one is that people always think the idea matters most. Oh, I need to have just a good idea and then I'll get started. Or they think too hard about the idea. They make business plans. They sketch out their model. They think too much. Now, of course, you know, thinking through your idea is important, but what's even more important is to immediately start testing it. And then based on the feedback, you adapt your idea. So people overvalue the idea and they undervalue the ability or the necessity to constantly adapt your idea with the inputs you get from the market. Oh, can you tell me actual examples from your experience of ideas which could have been tried and were not? So I, I don't know the ideas that haven't been tried. I know the ideas that have been tried and weren't tested. So you know, a good example is a, a company called Better Place. So they, uh, you know, you could almost call them the precursor of the Tesla. This was a startup. They said, we want to make electric vehicles, you know, um, popular around the world. And they, they asked, well, what's the biggest pain of electric vehicles? Yeah. Well, you need to charge the battery. So that's annoying. What if you could swap the battery in a battery swapping station? You drive in, you change the battery, you drive out. Sounds great. I can only talk about, you know, businesses that should have tested their idea and they didn't. Yeah. And they started building the business. Now, <laughs> the problem is they actually went bankrupt because people were not interested. So if they had tested this idea, they wouldn't have failed. And in the process of building this business, they raised quite a lot of money and they went bankrupt. They actually burned through $850 million. Like that's quite a bit of money, $850 million yeah. because they didn't systematically test their ideas. Now, yeah. if you take the counter example, Tesla. Yeah. So Tesla today is uh, pretty successful and yes, they have some scaling challenges. But what's really interesting is from the beginning, they had testing at the center of their DNA. So from the start, from the start, they tested if customer were, customers were interested, what they would be interested in, and they built their entire business based on feedback from the market. So you can see two very different examples of a company that didn't test their ideas and a company that did. Because if you look at Tesla, you know, they're also uh, 
charging stations around the world, you could say there are some similarities. It, they also built a very expensive infrastructure, not battery swapping stations, but battery charging stations. Mm -hmm. And they even give the charging away for free for a very long time. So testing is essential to not waste money. And if you test, you know, you are likely not to go bankrupt with a lot of money. Sometimes you test and you need to stop an idea. There are many, many startups or corporate startups. They test, they see, ah, oh, this is not working and they stop and then they move to something else. So you can't, sometimes you just have to learn there is no business for your idea. There is no market and you need to stop. You can't pivot yourself to success. Yes, very clear. Uh, which is the added value of your handbook in, compar in comparison with other similar books in the market? So I don't think there is actually a very similar book with a whole library of experiments to test your ideas. There's some, there's some things on the internet, um, you know, um, and there's some guides very specifically to how to conduct customer interviews. But to my knowledge, I haven't seen a very strong visual library that explains a whole series of experiments and how to use them. So that's the first thing. I don't actually, I don't think there is anything that is the same um, uh, in, in the form of a, of a physical book that I can use as a handbook. There's quite some information on the web. The other thing is, I do believe we go further in terms of you know, really, really being careful uh, with the methodology. So, you know, we redesigned the process of testing, which shouldn't just include testing, it should also include business design. Yes. So you need to constantly rethink your value proposition and business model. Many people, they just build something and they think, oh, I'm going to find my way to success. No. Number one, you should test a lot before you build. But number two, you need to really think through your value proposition and business model. At the end of the day, it's not about building a product, it's about building a business. So business design is at the center of this. It's not at the center of this particular book, but we describe how you need to go back and forth between shaping your idea and testing it in the field. So we're very, very, very careful in terms of methodology, and we try to make it extra simple, extra practical, so it's easy to learn. It's not that easy to do. You know, it's hard work. You need to learn how to do it. It's just you know, a little bit. You don't become a, a heart surgeon overnight. You need to learn how to do that. As a doctor, you first snip it around on dead bodies before yeah. you're allowed to do that with real bodies. Here, it's the same thing. You get better at innovation and entrepreneurship when you learn. And we try to make that learning as simple as possible so people can immediately apply it. So we, I believe we go this extra length where others don't go the extra length. It's almost like we say the infrastructure and the tools and the processes to help you do innovation are almost as important as you, know, you doing it yourself. Because if you, you get really good at it, you're going to understand how this really works. Nice. So we try to really, really, really make it extra practical, extra simple so people can focus their entire energy, energy, not on the process, but on shaping, adapting, and testing their idea. Yes, yes. yes. So you have answered the fifth question about the, about the extra simple, uh, the essential, the, uh, the concept of the ideas re re uh, reduced to the essential. Uh, yeah. So this book uh, helps to understand simply and effectively their potentiality. And this, uh, the, this, the question now is, is there any preparatory phase uh, before starting to test the business idea? Let me, yeah, let me maybe, let me, before I go to that, let me just add to the point before. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people, they say, yeah, yeah, but you know, tools and processes, that doesn't matter. You know, I'm tool and process agnostic. Well, I think that's very risky, right? You know, if you have to put a hammer in the wall, uh, a nail in the wall, you know, the quality of your hammer will make your work easier or harder. Yeah. So your toolbox actually is very important. Better tools allow you to work better. Mm -hmm. So when people say, oh, I'm tool agnostic, I don't really care which tool, they're making a huge mistake. So I think the simple, you know, simplicity and practicality of the tools and the processes make a phenomenal difference. You will get so much better if you use the right tools and the right processes. So I think 
today, if I look at some startups, if I look at some corporate accelerators, they're actually not realizing that if they don't get a lot better at picking the right tools and processes, they're making the lives of their entrepreneurs and innovators a lot harder than necessary. It's almost as you, you know, you'd say, oh, I'm going to give, it doesn't matter what tennis racket Roger Federer has. If he plays with the most modern racket or if he plays with the wooden racket from, you know, the last century, it won't make a difference. Of course it does. So yeah. I think we need to get a lot better in understanding what infrastructure are we providing for our entrepreneurs and our innovators. So for entrepreneurs, you know, it is maybe the government that should help with the education of entrepreneurs. And for corporations, it's the company that needs to give them the right infrastructure. I think we're almost criminal in the way we treat entrepreneurs and innovators. We're not doing a good job at really equipping them with the best tools. Because, you know, the better the tools, the better the processes, guess what, the better the output. It sounds trivial, but when you look in the field, people are very careless. And it's almost as they say, yeah, go ahead, Roger Federer, play with the, play with the wooden racket. That's okay. You're good enough, right? You're good as a tennis player. No, of course not. That doesn't work. You see what I mean? Uh, uh, easy to understand. Yes, that's very good. Yeah. Uh, and the, my question, uh, preparator, preparatory phase before starting to, starting to test uh, the business idea? So, so I wouldn't say there's a, um, a preparation phase. It's an entire process, which is a back and forth between shaping your idea and testing it. And you shouldn't overdo the thinking and preparation. You should go very fast on shaping your idea and say, okay, that's, that's, you know, let me sketch out a business model canvas, a value proposition canvas, and immediately get out into the field and start testing it. And then with what you learn, you go back and reshape your idea. So I think the only thing, and I wouldn't call it preparation phase, but I would call it part of the process. One important step that many, many people actually don't do well is to ask what are the underlying hypotheses that I need to test so this idea works? And basically the question you can ask is even simpler. What needs to be true for my idea to work? What needs to be true for my idea to work? That fundamental question will give you the hypothesis you need to test. And here's the big thing. Then you need to prioritize which one is the most important hypothesis, the most fundamental one. Because if you say, oh, I'm going to test if they have money to spend on this particular challenge. Well, maybe you want to know first if they even have the challenge, right? If they're even struggling with that thing. And once you know they're struggling with it, then you can start asking what's the right solution. And once you have that, you know, what's the right pricing, et cetera. So you need to really, really carefully identify the most important hypothesis. Yeah. Then you prioritize those hypothesis, hypothesis. Which one is the most fundamental one? Which one do I need to test? Because if that's not true, everybody else will fail. I'll give you an example. If you are intending to make a new iPad app for a specific customer segment, well, you need to first figure out, do they all have an iPad? Because if that customer segment doesn't have an iPad, well, you know what, then it doesn't really matter if they have the problem or not. So it's very fundamental stuff sometimes that we forget. So, you know, instead of immediately going and prototyping an iPad app, we'll figure out the basics. You know, do they even have an iPad? So, I think people often want to build too quick because they haven't prepared well. They haven't asked what's the most important hypothesis mm -hmm. and how am I going to test it? So that's a big mistake. People build things way too quickly. Oh, I need to make an MVP, a minimal viable product. No, you don't. Show me first the evidence that people have that challenge, that they want that solution. You don't need an MVP to do that. Show me that they're willing to pay, that they have a budget. You can do all of those things without building anything. So I think people need to get a little bit more sophisticated in the way they actually do this. You know, I think what, what was good five, you know, five, eight years ago today is amateurish. Today we do this professionally. Yeah. Yes, the use of, uh, of the word canvas is very interesting because the politicians who use this word to, to make campaign, uh, election campaign, uh, canvassing, to go canvassing, you know? And it's the same, uh, the same <laughs> meaning, I think, yeah? The, the, okay, uh, could you briefly outline the four different steps, design, test, experiments, mindset, 
to test one business idea or, as you write, to find one's path to scale? So, for me, there, there are two main aspects. So, one is business design, okay? One is business design, and the other one is testing. So, in business design, it act, there are three steps, okay? First, you kind of ideate what could be the right way to, you know, create value for customers in my business. Then you prototype that with the canvases, and then you do an assessment. Oh, is this, is this a good opportunity, bad opportunity? Is this the right business model? So that's business design. Three steps for business design. Ideation, business prototyping, and assessment. That you can do in a meeting room. You can do it at your office. But then you get into the testing phase. Again, there are three steps. First one is hypothesize. Ask yourself, what are the most important things that need to be true? Once you've done the hypothesizing, you need to experiment. Once you do the experiments, you start to learn. And once you've learned something, you need to make a decision. You go maybe back to the design loop. Oh, I need to decide, oh, people you know, don't like this value proposition, I need to change it. Oh, this value proposition, if they really want it this way, it's gonna to be too expensive, I need to change the business model. And then after the decision, you either go back to the design loop or you go on and test the next hypothesis. So it's a continuous back and forth between shaping your idea, testing it. Then you go back to shaping your idea, testing it. And in the entrepreneur's mind, this is like a, a double loop. You go through that again and again and again. So two big chunks, business design and testing. And each one has three steps. In business design, it's ideation, business prototyping, assessment in testing. It's hypothesizing, experimenting, learning. And the whole thing that holds it together is decisions to move forwards towards building a business. That's the, the essential point is not design, it's not testing, it's making decisions based on what you learn. And sometimes the decision is we should stop. Like let's, we raise some money, let's pay the investors back and dissolve this business. That's sometimes a very difficult step, but killing an idea is sometimes the right thing to do and sometimes people hang on for too long. On the other hand, sometimes people give up too easily. So it's a bit of, you know, finding that middle ground, what's the right decision? Yes, and do you, you think that, you think that, that the, your, your ideas, your test, um, your test uh, tools uh, may be successfully used for all sectors, industrial sectors? Uh, uh, everywhere. Or, or, so, oh, everywhere, yes. You know, I work a lot with pharmaceutical companies. Guess yesterday I was with one of the biggest banks in Europe and everywhere they face the same challenge. How do I create value for the customer and how do I create a business model that allows me to capture the value? And the thing, you know, it's the same challenge all the time. Oh, I have a new idea how I could do this. Well, let's go and test it. And it doesn't matter if you're in a pharmaceutical company or if you're in a bank, both highly regulated environments, you have to test your ideas if you want to decrease the risk of building something nobody wants. So it doesn't matter in what industry you are, in business to business, you know, you build uh, airplane engines, jet engines, guess, guess what? It's the same thing. You have to figure out how am I gonna create value for my customers, the airlines, and how am I gonna capture value for my business? If I'm Boeing or if I am Airbus, it's the same thing, or, or, or you know, Embraer. It's the same thing. So I need to test those things. Here's the big learning. You know, people always think, oh yeah, but you know, we can't build an MVP of that airplane engine because it would cost 30 millions of dollars to make a prototype. Well, when I say testing, I don't mean building something. I mean showing that there's a customer job pain and gain, that the needs are there. Show me that there's a willingness to pay for your new value proposition or new business model. So every single industry, I've, I've been in so many industries that I used to have a doubt that we can't do it everywhere, but I think it, you know, I've worked in the nuclear industry. I've worked in all different kinds of industries and I have never yet seen a case where, you know, you could say, no, no, here it's not possible everywhere. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you can do it with, uh, with, uh, in the space industry and you can do it in the car industry, you can do it in banking, you can do it in pharma, you can do it in nuclear, Give me one industry, you know, where you can't do it. I still, I'm still curious enough to see anybody who can show me that there's an industry where you shouldn't do this. Yes, yes. Uh, now I'd like to, to ask two questions uh, 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 together because 
they they are quest uh, they are questions about the uh, the the idea which uh, could come from an individual or, or on a team it's possible is it possible to uh, to have a very good idea business idea alone uh, an individual who is not so uh, as expert in the sector where he conceived the idea yeah for sure i think you know it's all very relative um, you're probably not going to create the next you know space flight as an individual so you always have to it's really relative um, but you can definitely come up with a new app uh, you know to start with that will you know potentially grow into something big, bigger um, yeah. so i definitely think you can create value as an individual um, one of the reasons is because with the internet you have access to the entire world from the beginning as soon as you have a broadband internet connection the world is your theater right the world is your theater but then again if you want to create the next next uh, space flight well you're probably not going to be able to do that on your own and definitely not as an industry outsider mm -hmm. one of the things you know i'm just um listening to a book at the moment um which is very interesting that shows that generalists are actually uh, very important in our time and that generalists often come, might come up with better solutions than pure experts. So the book I'm talking about here is called um, Range by David Epstein. And he says that, you know, hardcore experts in a field, they won't think outside of that field. So they'll come up with very good technical solutions for that particular field but they might not see the application of some knowledge in a different field. And that actually can come from individuals um, that can bring some of that to a different field because they're interested enough and they have enough curiosity to apply it somewhere. I don't think they will be able to stay alone for very long because probably have to bring those experts on board. But I do think generalists are often underestimated because we're in a, in a world you know, driven by hyper-specialists. So I do think you know, then there is a very, very good, uh, strong role for generalists working together with specialists. So I think very quickly, in most cases, you have to move towards a team, in particular when it's about something scalable. But then there's cases where you can do something on your own. You can have an online shop, you can have a, you know, make apps, it's everything is possible these days what you need to figure out is what do you really want to do what do you enjoy in life do you want to build a, a hundred million dollar company then you probably need a different approach than if you're happy with a one or five million dollar company uh -huh. yes yes it's true uh, and i have uh, two more questions the first one is uh, which is the impact of social media and of data mining on the testing process of, of a business idea I think it, it, you know, again, it depends a little bit in which industry you're in. So if you are in consumer goods, business to consumer, uh, I think it's wonderful what you can test with uh, people out there. So when we, you know, worked on the, the book cover of uh, testing business ideas, obviously I used LinkedIn and, you know, immediately it was pretty amazing. I had something like 60,000 views of our post around the book cover and people would give feedback, what they liked, what they didn't like. That's, you know, a gold mine. Then other people say, yeah, but Alex, you already have an audience. Like, it's hard for me. Nobody knows me. You know, I can't test my ideas. Yes, you can, because with Google ads or Facebook ads or Instagram ads, you can drive traffic. And if you can't drive traffic with a small budget, then probably nobody's interested in your idea anyways, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's easier than ever before today to test in the business to consumer space. That's number one. Now, if you're in business to business, there it turns out that, you know, people still search for key business topics on the internet. Not if we're talking hyper-specialized scientific research, because then you know, you go to research databases, et cetera, also on the internet, but you don't use Google. But, you know, very, for technical challenges, people still use Google. So you can use search trends um, to understand in business to business, what are some of the bigger trends? 
So I think it definitely changed. It's, it's one component, let me say it this way, it opens up a whole series of possibilities to test your ideas. But again, it's not everything, um, but it is something that is very valuable. And then the internet in general, great new tools to do uh, testing of uh, pricing. So you can do pre-sales, you can do uh, you know, um, crowdfunding campaigns. There's so many possibilities to test your ideas. The internet has definitely changed the game and made it much, much easier for everybody to get out there and test their ideas. There is no more excuse to not test your ideas. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and, um, uh, Professor Ostewald, uh, maybe you read uh, the, the story of my, of my grandfather's uncle <laughs> about, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> about the patent. And I, the the, the, the uh, issue is, when uh, must have a patent, must uh, ask for a patent in, in, the, in the story of uh, a business idea? So, again, sometimes a patent can make a difference. I'll give you a silly example. Nespresso, which is still one of my favorite cases, they built a you know, whole empire around selling Nespresso pods. Actually, the inventor, Eric Favre, He, he learned how to make great espresso in Italy, right? Of course, where else? Yeah. And he developed that into a system that he patented or that Nestle patented, Nespresso patented, and they built a very strong business model based on the patent. Okay, that's an example where a patent made a difference. Mm -hmm. Another example is Fujifilm. Um, you know, when Kodak went bankrupt, Fujifilm actually used their patents and their knowledge in chemical engineering to build a cosmetics brand. And they moved into cosmetics, they moved into the healthcare sector with the patents that they have. So, of course, patents are very, very powerful. Now, that's one side of, of business. If you take Tesla, you know, you could almost think of it differently. At the very beginning, and I don't know what the state is now, um, Tesla open sourced their patents, okay? Yes. So they said, no, 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 we want electric vehicles to become popular around the world. We're going to make our patents available. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know, you know what they protect now in terms of intellectual property, but their approach was exactly the contrary, at least for some aspects of their business model. Um, I'd have to read up now and see what they're protecting and what they're not protecting. So in the case of Tesla, I would say what's, what's keeping them ahead, yes, there's technology and they probably have some patents on that, but what's the real game changer is not actually the patents, it's the data they collected from their thousands and thousands of customers' car on the road. So they have an autopilot that learns constantly based on the cars that are out there, their customers, okay? Yes. BMW, Porsche, Audi, uh, Fiat, they don't have this data. So what's more important in that case than the patents is the data, okay? Mm -hmm. So today there's a numerous business models where patents don't matter anymore. But again, let's not be naive. Some businesses, patents matter. Take Dyson, they built a business model, an empire based on patents. Mm -hmm. In other areas, Data is the real powerful thing. 23andMe, you know, is based on data from DNA testing. Um, Tesla is based today, you know, their autopilot gets better and better based on the driving behavior of their customers. So I do believe nowadays there are many different business models where the business model is the differentiator, not the patent. So today I think patents still play a role, but they're not the only game in town. Yes, I understand. Uh, the very last question is, uh, which is the best place co to conceive ideas? Uh, Europe, California, which is, uh, my, uh, which is your idea, your, your opinion? I, I, let me quote somebody. I don't remember who it was, but somebody smart <laughs> said, you know, if there's one thing that's equally distributed across the world, it's talent. Mm -hmm. So I think today you'll find great ideas, you'll find great teams everywhere in the world. However, depending on what 
you want to build, what kind of company you want to build, in which industry, location does still matter. Even though you have access to you know, everything around the world, when you are doing scalable companies, you're probably better off in Silicon Valley. Why? Because at one point, you, know, you have to hire thousands of people who are going to scale your business. The place where you find most team members who have experience with that is still in Silicon Valley. They scale fast. They know how to do scaling. So you'll find the right people to do that. Yes. Uh, last year, I was in a place called Odensee in Denmark. Nobody knows, but it's actually one of the leading robotics clusters in the world. So if you want to build a robotics cluster, uh, company, you're probably well off to go to one of the places where you find the best talent for robotics. Because guess what? Odensee is now attracting talent from around the world to uh, Odense because they know this is the place to be when it comes to robotics. So depending on what you want to build, there are different places in the world that will make your life easier. So while talent is everywhere, ideas can come from everywhere, depending on what you build, it might be easier in some places. Okay, so, but then the other part, and I, I believe in this strongly, what's also pretty amazing is there's another space today, which is the space of distributed companies. It's easier and easier to build a distributed team. So depending on the industry, you don't need access to loca location-specific talent. You don't need access to specific capital, like capital in certain markets, mm -hmm. uh, where you have venture capitalists that know exactly in what, what kind of theme to invest. Distributed companies are also very popular, which means you can build a, you know, a company from anywhere. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't mind, you know, sitting in somewhere in a beautiful little house in Sardinia, um, running my company from there. I s chose Switzerland <laughs> as, a, as a place. But, you know, our company, our team is distributed around the world. We have an office in Zurich, we have an office in Toronto, but uh, um, team members across every single continent on the planet. Yes, yes, yes. Very well. Thank you very much, Professor Stelwalder. I inform you that this uh, uh, conversation will be used in a meeting of the Business Angel Network in Florence uh, in the next few days. I don't know when, but uh, we, we will uh, uh, listen to this conversation and we will discuss about your ideas and your book uh, together. This, uh, this in interview will uh, uh, be published in my uh, new online newspaper in English, uh, in, vi in uh, video and audio. And uh, I'll translate the, uh, our conversation in Italian and I'll write uh, a, a report about our conversation. Uh, this is uh, about your book. This is uh, uh, my, my aim. I thank you very much and f I hope to, to interview another time in, in, the, in the future, in the next future. Thank you very much. Wonderful. And thank you very much for taking the time to do this and investing energy into, you know, transcribing, yeah. writing sharing it is very important because i do believe you know we, we we make some good tools but we also want to get them out there so people can use them and angel investors have a pretty strong influence also on entrepreneurs uh, they can bring in the experience but they can also help um entrepreneurs use better tools use better processes and that helps us all get to the next level, right? So I appreciate your, uh, your support. Thank you very much. I belong to the uh, Business, uh, Angel, Business Angel Network and I, I um, help them uh, uh, in the communication operation. So uh, as this one, as this interview, yeah? okay. Thank you very much. Uh, grazie mille. Grazie. <laughs> Arrivederci. Arrivederci. Arrivederci.